This is slide two of the Civil Rights Unit. Uh, the protests grow as the 1950s go on. Uh, so do the protests. And we'll start with one uh, very well known that you've probably heard of involving a woman named Rosa Parks. Um, Parks was a young woman in uh, Montgomery, Alabama. Uh, worked a full day on the way home at the evening. She's tired, sitting on the city bus. Uh, and the city bus laws said that um, as buses filled up, blacks had to move to the back. Um, and then when the bus filled up completely, blacks had to give up their seats. Well, as the bus uh, began to fill up, more whites got on, uh, and Parks was told she had to get up and give up her seat, and she said, I'm not doing it. Um, the bus driver said, look, you know the laws, you got to give up your seat. She said, I'm not getting up. He said, well, I'm going to pull the bus over, call the police, and they're going to arrest you. He said, well, do what you have to do, but I'm not getting up. So, as the, the saying goes, she took a stand by sitting down, she, refusing to, to give up her seat. So Rosa Parks is arrested, and taking up um, her, uh, her cause, her case, if it were, um, is a young minister by the name of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. Um, and Dr. King will lead the, what comes to be known as, the Montgomery Bus Boycott. And there you see his name. Um, now, the way this worked was, um, all the blacks in Montgomery, Alabama, uh, agreed they were going to boycott the city buses. They were not going to ride the buses. Uh, they would get away, get around However they could, they'd find a way. Um, those blacks who had cars would run carpools. They would uh, take people wherever they went. Churches would get together and organize uh, to get people rides wherever they, they needed to go, especially the elderly, uh, if they needed to get to doctors or groceries or whatever. Um, some, not many, but some cabs uh, would agree to take uh, blacks around for the same price that it would have cost to ride the bus. Um, so they managed to find a way to make this work. And because blacks made up the majority of the bus riders, when they stopped riding the buses, the bus owners lost a lot of money. So the, uh, the bus owners, the companies, uh, the, sorry, the owners of the bus companies uh, went to the mayor of Montgomery and then the governor eventually and say, look, you gotta do something about this boycott. Uh, we're, we're going bankrupt here. Um, so he goes to Dr. King and the leaders of the boycott and says, all right, look, you've made your point. Now, time to end this. And they say, are you ready to change the laws? They say, no, we're not. Say, well, then we're not ending it. Um, ultimately, the bus boycott in Montgomery will last over a year, uh, 382 days. Uh, 382 days this boycott goes until eventually, uh, just because they're going to lose their companies, um, the owners of the bus companies convince um, the government of Montgomery to change their laws. So Dr. King, Rosa Parks, uh, and the supporters of the bus boycott will win their fight. Uh, they get the bus uh, segregation laws struck down. So it's another victory here. Now, speaking of Dr. King, this event is when he really comes to national prominence. He was a local leader, and he was known in Alabama. But when he takes up the cause of Rosa Parks, he really comes to be known uh, as a major player in the civil rights movement, a big-time leader. And it is Dr. King and a friend of his, a man named Ralph Abernathy, both of them pastors, will found the SCLC. And as you can see here in the middle of the, uh, the page, there's a picture of Dr. King there, the SCLC stands for the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Um, and as Dr. King and uh, Abernathy are both preachers and pastors, the SCLC, as the name says, Christian Leadership, uh, is going to set out to organize the churches of the South, black churches. Um, you know, if you've got 500 black churches throughout the South all working for 500 different things, 
nothing's ever going to get done. Uh, you got to get churches organized and all working toward the same goal uh, and the same project at the same time. So uh, the goal of King and Abernathy here will be to organize the black churches of the South. Churches have always been, probably always will be, the center of the black community. Uh, it's where the black uh, community goes to to celebrate, to mourn, to rejoice, uh, to pray. Uh, it's where they meet. It's where they get together for social causes, social events, uh, civil rights events, you name it. So if you can get the churches organized, you have a very powerful tool behind you. All right, let's turn our attention now to education and a group of nine black high school students who come to be known as the Little Rock Nine because this takes place in Little Rock, Arkansas. Uh, the Little Rock Nine, nine black students decide that because of Brown versus Board of Education, um, and this is in 1957, okay, so uh, three years after Brown versus Board. So they decide because of Brown versus Board ruling that they have a right to attend Little Rock's Central High School. It's an all-white high school. But according to the Supreme Court, there's not supposed to be anything such as all-white schools anymore because Brown versus Board desegregated the schools. So these nine black students show up on the first day of class to register uh, for classes. The governor of Arkansas, a man named Orville Falbus, great name there, great name, Governor Orville, uh, Governor Orville Falbus declares that uh, Little Rock schools will be integrated over his dead body. And he sends in the National Guard of Arkansas, not to ensure the safety of these students, but to block the doors of the school and not let these nine black students in. The Arkansas National Guard has orders to stop them from entering the school. Well, it's at this point that President Eisenhower is forced to, uh, to act. Right? He has to do something because a Supreme Court order, a federal court order, um, is being ignored. Not only is it being ignored, it's being blatantly contradicted. Um, so Eisenhower will federalize the National Guard troops. And to federalize troops means that you're going to put them under federal control. They're no longer under state control. So Governor Orville here no longer controls the National Guard troops. They are controlled by the president. And he will send in federal troops. The 101st Airborne, the Screaming Eagles here of World War II fame, uh, the 101st Airborne is sent to Little Rock to protect these nine black students. And if you look at the picture down here in the bottom, there you see the troops uh, over here on the left standing with... Uh, uh, the, uh, the, the the billy clubs here, the nightsticks, they've got uh, automatic weapons. Uh, these are full-fledged, honest-to-goodness U.S. soldiers that are sent to protect these students. Now, this picture, very iconic picture here, this young woman uh, trying to go to, to, to class here, and look at this woman behind her. You can just see the hatred, the anger on her face, screaming at this young lady uh, who's simply just trying to go to school, right? Eventually, these nine students will be allowed in school. Uh, and for the first few months of school in 1957-58 school year, um, they are escorted to and from school and to and from class by federal troops. There are armed soldiers inside Central High School going to class with these students, standing in the back of class to make sure that nothing happens to them, uh, to protect them. Uh, and these students will end up, um, eight of them, I think, one moves, uh, but eight of them end up uh, graduating from Central High School. So they win a victory. Okay. Um, lastly here, we see a new type of protest starting called set-ins. Uh, and this is the beginnings, really, of sort of uh, Dr. King's peaceful, nonviolent protest movement. Uh, the set-ins are simply where you go to whatever it is you're protesting and you sit down. You don't uh, cause any problems. You don't scream and shout. You don't walk around with signs. You, you sit down. 
uh, and refuse to leave until whatever it is you're protesting gets changed. Okay? Uh, in this case, what they were protesting uh, was segregated lunch counters. Uh, and this pl- takes place sorry, in Greensboro, North Carolina, at a store called Woolworths. Now, Woolworths would be like a modern-day equivalent of like a Walgreens um, or something like that, a uh, CVS, maybe a little bigger, but not much. Um, but they would have, um, the, the Woolworths would all have a lunch counter in them, as you see in this picture uh, here at the bottom. Um, the lunch counters were segregated. They only served whites only. Uh, Even though black men, as you see here, had to work at the lunch counter, they were only allowed to serve whites. Well, these four black students from a local college in Greensboro, North Carolina, decide they're going to go sit down at the lunch counter. Well, they, of course, refuse service, and they say, we're not leaving. Um, They get uh, white uh, customers would order food just to throw it on them. They would have drinks poured over their head, food smeared in their face, thrown at them um, until the police showed up and dragged them out of the Woolworths. Well, they went back to their school. They came back the next day with 19 classmates, and they sat down and refused to leave until they were served. They were dragged out again. They come back the next day with 85 students. By the, they keep doing this day after day after day. By the end of the week, over a thousand black students at this local college were going to this Woolworths to protest the segregation. And eventually, because the Woolworths is losing more and more and more money, they give in and they change their policies and agree uh, to serve blacks at their lunch counters. So the set in works, the peaceful, nonviolent protest works. This will be led by um, a group of students known as SNCC, S-N-C-C. The the nickname is called SNCC, but it stands for Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. The Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Um, and the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC, would be responsible for organizing nonviolent student protests throughout the South. Uh, and they'll take on a much bigger cause um, in a later on slide. But that's it for this one.